رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Al-A'raf, the seventh surah of the Qur'an, which is one of the longest Makki surahs in the Qur'an, mentions towards the latter half of the surah that he himself explains the ayat. You know, Allah oftentimes says that he reveals the ayat, but sometimes he also says things like, وَكَذَلِكَ نُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ that, that is how we ourselves explain the signs. Al-ayat is not just a reference to revelation, it's also a refl- reference to reality. Allah explains everything around you. And every time he explains something, there's a purpose. And so the purpose mentioned in this particular ayah is peculiar. He says, لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ So that they can come back. What Allah is about to talk about now is He's gonna explain some phenomenon and the purpose of explaining it is to talk to people that have gone far away from Allah and to bring them back. That's the purpose of it. And so he says, لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ So that they may return. He says this peculiar story Oftentimes in the Qur'an, Allah will tell a story, but He will not tell us the name of the characters, He will not tell us the details, He will not tell us the geographic location, or the dates, or the, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the intricate you know, history involved in order for us to understand the full picture. It's very different from any book of history. As a matter of fact, the language here is so general, it could apply to anybody. And yet Allah Azza wa Jal makes it very specific at the same time and says, وَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ نَبَأَ أَلَّذِي آتَيْنَاهُ آيَاتِنَا Read on to them, recite on to them the news or the event of the one to whom we had given our miracles. Now who in the world is this person to whom Allah gave his miracles? The first thing to note here is the word وَتْلُوا Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent to the unlettered people, the Meccans. And he himself is a Nabi al-Ummi, the messenger that is unlettered. And so ulama comment, how is he reading on to them? The idea was this story and other stories like it, when Allah mentions the word watlu, he's actually telling the people of Mecca and by extension all of us, that he's going to educate us with something that we had no idea of before. And something that must be repeated over and over again, because its relevance will be renewed. It's not just a story of old times, it's something that applies to you and me now. It's a living text, it's a living account. And that's why keeping it general is important. I told you Allah doesn't mention the specific names of the characters involved in this account, this person that Allah is going to talk about. Why? Because it's an archetype. What that means is it could be any one of you, it could be me. It could be, to, it could be our own story. Pay attention to it and see if it applies to you. I pay attention to it and I see if it applies to me. الَّذِي آتَيْنَاهُ آيَاتِنَا Those to whom we had given our ayat, our revelations. In other words, this is a person who was given by Allah access to his guidance. Some scholar who has been studying the Qur'an and the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ and the history of our deen and the divine law, the sharia, for 50 years has been given the ayat of Allah. But also someone who was sitting in a public library and opened up a translation of the Qur'an and read a couple of pages and became a Muslim, he's also been given the ayat. So Allah does not qualify here that he's talking about someone at a very high caliber of scholarship as opposed to someone who just knows a little bit about Islam. It's everybody and everybody because Allah has given some to every one of us. As a matter of fact, especially the people sitting here listening to the Jumu'ah prayer, you have all, including myself, been given ayat of Allah. So at one level or another, it applies to all of us. آتَيْنَاهُ ayatina. Because even if you know just a little bit about the Qur'an, little bit about Allah's guidance, even if you just know like the first words of the Fatiha, or all you know is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, that is still from the ayat of Allah. That is still something Allah gave you. So the favor of Allah, the imtinan of Allah in this ayah is established on everybody listening. It's not talking about someone that is distant from you or me. آتَيْنَاهُ ayatina. But then he describes the problem, the news of this person. Let me tell you about the account of this person who had, we had given our guidance to, our revelations to. We taught him something about this faith. Allah Himself says He's the one who facilitated that learning. And then He says, فَانْسَلَخَ مِنْهَا الْإِنْسِلَاءُ خُرُوجُ جَسَدِ الْحَيْوَانِ حَيَوَانِ مِنْ جِلْدِهِ مِثْلَ الْحَيَّةِ they say in Arabic that the word insilah is used for when an animal sheds a, a skin. Like a popular example would be a snake. Snakes shed their skin. And so only the foreskin is left behind. Like especially larger snakes, they do that a lot. And you have just the foreskin left. Now, 
even though that's the image of a of a snake, Allah wasn't talking about a snake. Allah was talking about a person who Allah taught religion to. Allah taught them something about his deen. He gave him some ayat. So what does that have to do with a snake leaving its skin? Allah is actually painting the picture of a person who kept the religion on the outside, but slithered out of it from the inside. He removed it from the inside. So the religion was only something they wore almost like a disguise. Right? It didn't really impact them on the inside. Even if they were doing the practices of the religion, like prayer, or eating halal, or saying salam, or dressing a certain way, that was all on the outside. But the inside had already left. There was no soul left in this person that is attached to the faith. It's just this artificial expression of the religion. It's like the shell without the egg, that kind of thing. You know? So Allah says, I want you to hear the news about someone who we gave access to our religion. They learned about our faith, and yet they just kept it on the outside. And they slithered out of it. They slipped out of it. You know? So it gives the impression that they're there in Islam, that they're sincere, they're practicing, they're learning, etc., etc. But on the inside, there's nothing left. What a terrifying image. فَانْسَلَخَ minha. Now let's talk about that at multiple levels. This could happen, like I told you in the beginning, it could happen to somebody who just knows this little about Islam. And this could also apply to someone who spent their entire life studying the religion. People that are very minimally knowledgeable of the faith, and people that are even scholars of the faith. It could happen that at one point or another, they, and by the way, الْإِنْسِلَاقَ الْإِبْتِعَادِ كَذَلِكَ They say to distance oneself. They lose touch with what Allah had given them. If a person loses touch with what Allah has given you, with the revelation that Allah has given you. No matter how much knowledge you and I acquired in our life, no matter how much you've read or studied or worshipped, the nature of this religion, the nature of this revelation, is that you cannot just have it and hold on to it without any effort. You can't say, I read the entire Qur'an two years ago, and now I know what it says, it's good enough. You can't. Allah says to the Israelites, خُذُوا مَا آتَيْنَاكُمْ بِقُوَّةٍ وَذْكُرُوا مَا فِيهِ In another place, وَاسْمَعُوا Hold on to what we've given you with, with great strength. You gotta hold on tight to this book, and keep remembering what's in it. And in another place he says, keep listening, keep on listening. You have to put yourself in an environment where you're not just giving advice, but also taking advice. You're not just, I already know this stuff, you have to review this stuff. You have to reconnect yourself with the religion over and over again. Otherwise, from the, from the outside, you're still knowledgeable. From the outside, you can still quote the ayat. From the outside, you still seem like you're practicing. But from the inside, your heart has been separated from the word of Allah, from the ayat that you were given. And so he says, فَانْسَلَخَ minha." He basically internally, emotionally, spiritually distanced himself from the revelation. So the outside is different now from the inside. And when that happens, فَأَتْبَعَهُ shaytan. Shaytan immediately got behind him and started pursuing him wholeheartedly. Now the idea of tabi'ah in Arabic, tabi'ah means to follow someone. But when you say atba'ah, it actually becomes a kind of mubalagha. He followed him 100%. Like there was not a second that shaytan would leave him alone. We're learning something very interesting about shaytan now. We're learning that the people who come towards Allah, who Allah gives guidance to, when they start slipping, shaitan seizes the opportunity and he gets on your case like he, you become his main project. You become, he drops every other distraction, he's on you. فَأَتْبَعَهُ shaitan. You know? And so shaitan will constantly poke at him. And now of course shaitan is gonna give him suggestions that conflict with, that are the exact opposite of the ayat that Allah had given him. Allah had taught this person, a man or a woman, the difference between right and wrong. The difference between being courteous and caring and honest and generous, and between being selfish and self-righteous and deluded and all of these things. But shaitan will come and take what he wants you to follow, and he'll start making the revelation something distant from this person, and the disobedience to Allah starts becoming beautified. وَزَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ Shaitan beautified their deeds to them. And so as he starts doing that, what does Allah say? فَكَانَ مِنَ الْغَاوِينَ Then he became from those who've gone off course. غَوَى in Arabic is when someone was going on the right course, and they took a turn and they just went off the wrong course. غَاوِينَ You took the wrong exit on the highway and you can't even get back on the highway. 
That's Ghawin. Allah is describing a very scary phenomenon here. Shaitan is not, his, his project in this, this story, in this account, is not people that have forgotten about Allah, that don't believe in Allah. He's not talking about those people. He's talking about good people who have the ayat of Allah, and somehow they started slipping away, distancing themselves, and then shaitan got them good. And when shaitan is completely on your case, he will make you do things, even other people that are not even religious. They don't even do such things. And here's this person is, who's a person of faith, he's a person of religion, and he can stoop down to those levels. He can do things that weren't even expected of a non-Muslim. He can fall to those levels. يعني أسفل سافلين, the lowest of the low. And so as, as the ayat, as the story goes on of this person, who slipped out of the ayat and shaitan got on his case, Allah mentions the tragedy. He says, وَلَوْ شِئْنَا لَرَفَعْنَاهُ بِهَا Had we wanted, we would have raised him because of the knowledge we had given him. Because of the ayat that we had given him. بِهَا يعني بِسَبَبِهَا So Allah is saying that the ayat that Allah gave you, the point of them was to lift you up. The idea of lifting up is actually part of Qur'an's imagery. Other places in the Qur'an like Surah An-Nur, Allah will describe three kinds of creatures on the earth. You know, there are those like human beings, like the human being stands up straight. He stands up straight. And then there is yamshi ala arba, those who walk on four legs. Animals that walk on four legs. Yamshi ala batnihi. Min hum man yamshi ala batni. Those who walk on their, on their belly, like a snake. Now here you see already, there's already an image of a snake mentioned. And the snake is closest to the ground. And a human being, as far as his face, his eyes, you know, his, his body is furthest from the ground. The only thing touching the ground for us is our feet. Other animals, the ones that walk on their fours, they're constantly looking down. You notice, because of the way their bodies are designed, they're constantly focused towards the earth. So the lowest of the animals is the snake. And Allah is now describing, had we wanted, He could have been a human being standing up straight. لَرَفَعْنَاهُ بِهَا Like Allah created the human being. And by the way, when, we, when human beings look up, they look up at the sky. They have higher goals. We, have, we aspire to things that come from the heavens. As opposed to like animals whose only pursuits are on the earth, they only look down. They're not looking up. They don't, they don't, you know, they don't look forward. أَفَمَنْ يَمْشِي مُكِبًّا عَلَى وَجْهِهِ أَهْدَى أَمَّنْ يَمْشِي سَوِيًّا عَلَى صِرَاتٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Like in Surah Al-Mulk. How can someone who just has his face buried into the ground be compared to someone who stands up straight? This is the imagery of the Qur'an in these ayat. So he says, had we wanted, we could have elevated him. In other words, we could have made him even better and better and better. You know a little bit? You don't know much about the deen, you know him just a little bit, but because of that little you know, Allah could have raised you to the next level. And then from there to the next level. And then from there to the next level. It's okay if you didn't compare to the imam, or you didn't compare to the greatest scholars or the greatest worshippers. You yourself were on a trajectory to become better and better and better, because of what little Allah had started you off with. What guidance Allah had given you. وَلَكِنَّهُ أَخْلَدَ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ However, he became completely inclined towards the earth. Akhlada comes from the word khulud. Actually here, interestingly, it's the word ikhlad, which is to make something permanent. Not to be some, uh, permanent, but to make something permanent. يعني أخلد نفسه إلى الأرض. أخلد هواه إلى الأرض. أخلد همه إلى الأرض. He made his entire, all that he wanted. Everything he ever wanted, now became something having to do with this world. This is a person who knows about Jannah, he knows about meeting with Allah, he knows about Judgment Day, and yet as they distance themselves, the only thing they think about, the only thing they love, the only thing that becomes their priority, are things they can get in this world. Whatever desires they have of money, of wealth, of fame, of lust, that's all they can think about. They can't think about anything else, or control, there's no concern about when they're going to stand in front of Allah. What a tragedy that a person who would have revelation, who would know they, they should have better priorities in life, all they can think about is this now. أَخْلَدَ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ And so the, as Allah concludes this parable, He says, فَمَثَلُهُ Then how can this person be described? This person that first of all is acting like a snake, and now Allah is going to give even a worse example. You know, He says, فَمَثَلُهُ كَمَثَلِ الْكَلْبِ his example is something like a dog, like the dog. That's already offensive as it is. 
Because a dog is one of the creatures that can on the one hand lo- have loyalty, but Allah is going to describe, He's talking actually about a rabid dog or like a stray dog. And we're going to see that from the language itself. Now this dog that Allah describes, and you know, in the Qur'an you get other examples of people and they're compared to animals. Like the Israelites who didn't do right by their book, they were compared to mules. كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُ asfara. They were compared to mules. But this person, even worse, they're being compared to the dog. And then what does he say about this dog? He says, إِن تَحْمِلْ عَلَيْهِ يَلْهَثِ if you were to put something on this dog, if you were to b- burden this dog with something, tie this dog to a load and he has to drag the load, he has to, the dog is made to do work of some kind, carry something, yalhath, he's gonna start panting, imtidadul lisan, ma'ashiddat al-tanafus, they say. Yalhath means breathing heavy and sticking your tongue out, literally panting. <laughs> That's what the dog does. When, does, when, someone stick, when an animal sticks its tongue out and it's panting heavy, it actually means that it's exhausted. So Allah says, very specific language. He says, if you put a load on it, it start, it's going to start panting. وَإِن تَتْرُكْهُ And if you were to leave it alone, يَلْهَثْ It'll start panting, it'll keep panting anyway. It'll stick its tongue out and drool anyway. What in the world does that mean? What does that have to do with you and me and a person who had guidance? That Allah gives this strange, strange image of a dog that is being made to do a lot of work and it's panting, or if it's left alone, it's still panting. The idea of, of lahath, of panting, is actually a kind of disturbance. A creature, a human being, any animal doesn't pant until they're disturbed, overwhelmed, bothered, unsatisfied, thirsty. This, this is the image of someone that's unsatiated, unfulfilled. And so our ulama commented exhaustively on this, the use of the word hamil, to load onto it, to put a responsibility on it, is used in the Qur'an for revelation. This person becomes like a dog. When they hear about the religion now, they start getting bothered. Like, this is a religious person, this is a person who knows about the deen, but since they've shed away from it, now even when they hear a reminder about what's, what's, you know, what's right and wrong in their faith, internally they don't like it anymore. They're bothered by it. They're disturbed. They, they can't even find peace in prayer, in the gatherings of Muslims, in learning. They can't. And so they want to get away from this company and they want to slither away to some dark company, some bad environment. But when they go there, of course, they're still disturbed. They were hoping they could leave this place and find peace somewhere else. They don't find peace. Others have said this has to do with their un. un satiated thirst, like when they become worldly, then Allah Azza wa Jal makes their thirst for the world unending. Shaitan got behind them, they allowed shaitan to get behind them, and now basically shaitan makes them want to consume and consume and consume, even if there's no more to consume. What in the world does that mean? It actually means a person who's, for example, they get, they get obsessed with money, they get obsessed with desire, with lust, they get obsessed with food, they get obsessed with stuff. They're, they're thinking about food when they're hungry. They're thinking about food when they're not hungry. <laughs> That's all they can think about. They're, they're throwing up from lunch and they're worried about where am I going to have dinner. You know? They have, they, they have, and they get, they get obsessed with stuff. They're buried under debt and they're thinking about what can I put on my, what can I buy from my credit card now? What more can I get? People become indulged in unhealthy things and they can't stop themselves like a dog can't stop itself from panting. Whether there's a reason to or not, whether there's a need or not, whether it's justified or not. And so as, as this hideous image is brought to a close, Allah Azza wa Jal says, ذَلِكَ مَثَلُ الْقَوْمِ الَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا That is the example of people who called or who considered our miracles a lie. The phrase, الَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا in the Qur'an is used for disbelievers. It's not used for believers. And here in this ayah, it's actually started off talking about someone who actually believed. And then says, these people at this point, they are no different as far as Allah is concerned than disbelievers. What's the point? You were given this revelation so you could live like a human being, not like an animal. Not like you have an impulse and you follow it. If you couldn't do that, if you couldn't live up to that, then what's the point? How are you any different than anybody else? 
just pretending to abide by revelation, to have reverence for the book of Allah on the outside, and not abiding by any of its teaching on the inside. Alladina kathabu bi ayatina. And so I'm just baffled by how Allah Azza wa Jal concludes this ayah. Faqsusil qasas la allahum yatafakkarun. Tell multiple stories so they can think. That's how the ayah ends. Tell multiple al qasas, the plural. In other words, this phenomenon is not one phenomenon. It's gonna happen over and over and over again. There are going to be people around you that used to be religious and then just disappeared. From a, from a, you know, just secretly not abiding by the religion to outright just not even abiding by it at all. There are going to be, you know, stories like this that are gonna happen all around you. Think about them. لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ So they can think deeply. Think deeply. Am I heading down this path? Why does a person have to think deeply? When every time in Qur'an, Allah asks you to think deeply, it's actually about yourself. Look up the word tafakkur in the Qur'an. Every time, it's actually about yourself. Somehow it comes back to you. When this ayah ends, instead of you and I thinking about some other horror story of somebody else, Allah is saying, tell them those stories, so they're not the next horror story. So they're not the next ones to fall down these traps. You know, in this, in, among those who cited how this ayah applies, I'll leave you with this thought. There are people who Allah has made the study of the religion easy. Like this, this is even the stories of people at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. People who learned the Bible, learned Arabs, who learned Hebrew, studied religion, became more convinced of the idea of one God. They were okay with all of that, but they weren't so sure about Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And they came and they said, you know, Aslamtu bil Hanifiyya, I'm I'm okay with this one God concept. I like this concept. I don't like shirk either. But I'm not so sure about you. I'm not so sure if you're a messenger. They would say to the Prophet. And Rasul would challenge them and, and show them guidance and, and give them the proofs. And those people, it would become clear later on that their study and their infatuation and their interest in the concept of religion was something else. And their personal insides were something else. And Rasulullah sallallahu had the, wasallam had the foresight, the insight actually, to catch it and say, what you have on your tongue is not what you have in your heart. They're two different things. And they became some of the worst enemies of Islam. There are people to this day who slither out of the teachings. Like I, when I was doing some Islamic studies at a university, we had professors, non-Muslim professors, that are like, they, they, they stu- they've studied the Qur'an for decades. I mean, they're, they're very, very knowledgeable in Qur'an. And they're even as willing to go as far as to say, it can only be divine, it can only be from God. It's not even human. You went that far, that's practically saying you're Muslim. So I would just come out and say, so what's keeping you? Well, it's remarkable really, but it's, a, it's something to consider, isn't it? That's it. You can't take the next step. You can't do it because you have, you've been given so many ayat, but you, you just don't want to make the commitment because it requires change. Oh, if you, because if you change, if you, if you accept this, then you're gonna have to make changes. You know? You, you know, Allah says, بَلْ يُرِيدُ الْإِنسَانُ لِيَفْجُرَ أَمَامَهُ That's the real reason. People just wanna keep doing whatever they feel like doing. That's the real reason. They just have some stuff in front of them, and they wanna be impulsive and do it and not think about the consequences. When you accept this religion, every time you say something, every time you do something, every time, you, every time you're about to take an action, every time you're about to make a transaction, you're gonna think about the consequences. You're gonna stop yourself. You know, وَنَاهَا nafsa anil الْهَوَىٰ He stopped himself from following whatever thought came in his mind. That's what one of the things that this religion does. They don't wanna do that. They can find the religion interesting, they can study it, they can learn it, they can quote a lot about it. You know, they can be fascinated by its learning, but that's it. And unfortunately that becomes the case of some people, even the regular Muslims. They're, they love recitation of Qur'an, they love it. They love listening to talks. Have you heard this one's speeches? Have you heard that one's speeches? Man, I downloaded all of them. You love listening to stuff, you love quoting stuff, you love collecting books. But living by that stuff, eh, you know, let's, let's just do insilah, let's just shut out of that. And keep our priorities no different than the priorities who don't have iman. 
May Allah Azza wa make us of those who aren't just artificially committed to our faith. But from the outside and the inside, we are wholly giving ourselves up before Allah. May Allah Azza wa Jal overlook our shortcomings and not make us of those who shaitan has gotten behind and we're not able to seek protection from him. May Allah protect us from the waswasa of shaitan. And I ask Allah Azza wa that especially our young, our old, our, our men, our women, our children, that they are all given a genuine, a genuine love of the deen of Allah, the book of Allah. Allah, and, a, and a sense of appreciation for the revelation that has been gifted to every single one of us that we hold on to it for dear life. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Quran al Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al Hakim. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi al ladhi nastafa khususan ala afdalihim wa khatam al nabiyin. محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا